Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and I am doing a promo video here to advertise my new book, which is called Star Wars Scene by Scene. It's the second book in my Scene by Scene cinema series. Uh, I'm in the middle of working on a book about The Shining right now, uh, and there will be other books that will follow, such as Blade Runner and Alien and, and Videodrome and so forth, and also eventually <clears throat> David Lynch's films. Um, but in this book, uh, it is Star Wars Scene by Scene, and what I have done basically here uh, I followed the format of the Apocalypse Now scene by scene book where I go in and analyze the semiotic significances of each of the scenes of the film. And I've divided the film, as I did in Apocalypse Now, into two halves. Um, and the first half um, is entitled The Escape from Tatooine, which essentially does occupy uh, the film's first half. It takes them nearly an hour to get out of the orb of Tatooine. And uh, the second half um, is uh, called Against the Death Star. And so basically I see the film as a tale of two orbs. And the orbs of the Death Star versus Tatooine are essentially personifications of two different sets of American values. The Death Star personifies the American values of empire, uh, expansionism, but also the surrounding and encompassing of the Earth with uh, satellites, global GPS configurations, and uh, the new surveillance state that tracks all of us. Um, that is essentially what the Death Star represents. It is the technocratic control of the Earth, the putting of the Earth inside of a technological exoskeleton that surrounds it. And you'll notice that um, all the characters who are on the sort of dark side or characters who are associated with uh, the Death Star are essentially, they wear exoskeletons, all the stormtroopers and Darth Vader, uh, maybe not uh, the Grand Moff Tarkin character, but and some of the administrative officials, but the main characters, and then later on Boba Fett is another character, they're all exoskeletal in nature, like the ancient placodermic fish from the Devonian age, way, way back, 300 million years ago or so, who had bony outer shell casings. And so a negative valency is given to these exoskeletal characters. Um, they, they, it's as though they are an evolutionary throwback. And the stormtroopers are shown riding on invariably on reptilian lizard beasts. So there's an association there with exoskeletal creatures, such as crustaceans and sea creatures and reptiles. Uh, both lay eggs. And there's an association there with a sort of regressed uh, primordial level of consciousness that is only associated with fight or flight and survival instincts and has no interest in the values of the building of culture, art, religion, so forth. It is the erasure. Uh, it also stands for the effacing and erasing of all places on the maps. Every place on every map is the same as every other place, as Heidegger warned in his essays, and he was the first to see the danger and the significance of constructing a global world that makes the far near and the near far, and therefore it makes every place the same as every other place, and in doing so transforms the planet into a kind of giant global anti-world. That's what the Death Star represents. Those are the values that the film is against. Tatooine, on the other hand, represents the values of the local, the specific the place. It is a desert planet that has been inspired by Frank Herbert's Dune, uh, and so Tatooine is essentially a rackus in disguise, just as the Death Star was inspired by the city of Trantor from Isaac Asimov's Foundation novels. Trantor is a giant planet-wide city that's coextensive with the entire globe of the planet. And so basically we have, in this tale of two orbs, Arrakis versus Trantor, uh, Tatooine is the realm of the Earth, and we note that Luke Skywalker, the first time we see him, comes up out of the ground. He comes up out of the pit house, uh, the tool shed garage thing that they have for working on robots. He comes right up out of it, and their dwellings, they essentially live underground there, like mere cats or moles or animals that dig holes in the Earth and then come up from out of them. So his valency is associated with the Earth and the values of the local, place-specific, earthly, stonic values, as against, and, and also therefore note mammalian, the warm, emotional, mammalian warmth of these characters, and none of the characters uh, that we're rooting for, Han Solo, Princess Leia, and so forth, are exoskeletal in nature. They don't wear exoskeletons, only the bad guys do, because they're associated with less evolved uh, animal forms versus the mammalian values of love and warmth and courage and, and, and so forth. All the things that uh, the nurturing of the young from the womb. Princess Leia is essentially the earth goddess 
uh, from Wagner's opera Goethe Dämmerung, In the Sky. She is Erda, and her capturing at the beginning of the film is the attempt of uh, the Death Star to capture the Earth Goddess, which means it's essentially placing the Earth on the inside of a technological environment, as we have done with our Earth ever since Sputnik went around it in 1957. And so we have a tale of two orbs and uh, two different systems of values that are clashing here, the values of the local and the specific, the respect for culture, art, and religion that Luke Skywalker represents. He also has the name Skywalker as an opposed valency to his earthly uh, dirt valency, you might say, which suggests that he has the potential then to unite both worlds, since Skywalker indicates that he has a heavenly pedigree as well as an earthly one, so he contains the potential to unite both of these worlds. And so the film is essentially a tale of two orbs, and I also make the argument for it in this book that this film is essentially the American national epic. When I was a high school uh, sophomore a student in college professors, English professors, used to ask, what is the American national epic? Every other culture, every other civilization seems to have one. The Italians have Dante's Divine Comedy, the British have uh, Paradise Lost, uh, the, the Germans have their Wagnerian epics, and uh, the Persians have the Shahnama, uh, the Greeks had the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the Hindus had two epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. What is the great national American epic? Is it Moby Dick? Uh, uh, is it Huckleberry Finn? And the professors would throw their hands up and they would say there's no real clear candidate for uh, an American national epic. And part of that has to do with the fact that when it comes to writing and novels and books, writing, American writing tends to exhibit very specific regional values. Hemingway is a writer of the North, just as Faulkner is a writer of Southern values. And a national epic would have to incorporate all of these values from all of these different regions. There are nine nations in North America, as Joel Garreau wrote about in his book, The Nine Nations of North America, each of which have very specific and different values. The values of the North are industrial. The values of the South are agrarian. The values of the West Coast are ecotopic. The values of the Southwest are Hispanic, uh, more or less. And all the value systems are in collision. They're different. The values of the Midwest are the values of farmers. Um, and the values of the far great empty West are those of miners. And so uh, Star Wars, though, I think is the first film that takes all of those value systems and puts them together. They're all in there. The farmer's values are there with Luke living on a farm. Uh, in the cowboy values of the Southwest are also there. Uh, you get Southwestern style shootouts in the scene with Han Solo and Greedo. Uh, those values are there. The Death Star representing the Northern industrial values. All of that is in there. Star Wars is the great national American epic, and this book makes the argument for it as such. Uh, it's just that it isn't a work of literature. It's a multimedia work. It's a work of celluloid from 1977 that engulfs and swallows up absolutely all media. Um, McLuhan, with his understanding media in 1964, had just come out and considered advertising the great popular art form. And in New York, uh, Andy Warhol and company were creating pop art as a new respectable art form. So the values between highbrow and lowbrow were disintegrating. And so it, it, is, it became possible then to have a non-literary work, perhaps for the first time, be a work of celluloid. And I think uh, a non-literary national epic, that is, be a work of celluloid. And I think Star Wars fits the bill perfectly. It is the great national American mythos. And it is the great epic that we as Americans can be proud of, and that celebrates all American values. You will find them all in that film. And so that's my new book, Star Wars Scene by Scene. It's available for ordering on Amazon, and I hope you'll uh, purchase a copy.